Here we go, turn the sound down a little bit so there's no feedback. It's all a bit technical for me, but under 50% does it, I found by experimenting. Uh, so you're listening to Revolution Radio, my name's Dennis. Uh, the show's called Free Association. Um, and I was just setting it up. I went straight into it and I should have done all my technical stuff first. But uh, I was just setting up um, a, a conversation that I'm having uh, with myself about my relationship to groups. Uh, let me share the chat room as well. Cause of... Okay, so there's the chat room for the share screen. Um, so this this group on a Sunday that I was going to is a it's an ongoing group. It's been happening forever. Uh, the, the people who show up tend to be either professionals. Uh, there's a there's a, a clinical psychologist in there. There's a there was for a long time a, a social worker in there. There's a guy who's trained in psychotherapy in there, who's a, an ex-university uh, lecturer. Uh, and there's a lot of other people who've got personal issues or a history of being in and out of psychological establishments. Or have just got issues with relationships with people. Or relationships with food or relationships with the world in general so it's it's not really an issue based support group it's just a group that meets and things happen because of the combination of people in the group and uh, the, I, I found this group through the Newcastle Philosophy Society when I joined that and I went uh, it took me two two attempts to get to to a philosophy society meeting um, but the second attempt I got there, and it was uh, it was Midsummer's Day, five years ago, I think. Uh, I tried to get to a Tuesday night, and I couldn't quite get there. But I got to the Saturday morning. So whenever the Saturday morning was the twenty first of June, that was the year that got that I got there. It feels like it's probably five years ago. It might be four, or it could even be six. I'm not specific about it. I don't remember dates that much. But uh, on the on the yeah, it must have been the Saturday. Uh, we went from a meeting. I don't remember the, the subject of the meeting, but we went over to the bar that's opposite on the opposite side of the road. Uh, it's a two-hour. The official meeting is two hours uh, from ten thirty till tw twelve thirty, and then we go over for coffee or food or a beer or whatever people want to do in the bar over the road. Uh, and take two two or three tables and continue the discussion uh, with less of a structure. So usually there's, there's about 20 people, 22 people show up for the official meeting and then about 12 people go over to the bar. Um, yeah, I remember the first day I went there. I don't remember the topic, but I, but I, I got an invite over to the for coffee to the union, the union rooms was the bar, which is an old um, transport and general workers union building. It is literally an old union building. Very, very nice building. Two floors. Uh, very nice building, like Victorian or Edwardian building with pillars outside of it. And upstairs there's a there's an open floor with a a bar around like an L, L shape with a bar around the L and a set and a secondary room. Downstairs they've got three rooms. And if we're downstairs we normally take the the front room, which is the library room, which kind of makes sense for a philosophy group. <laughs> there's new wallpaper with books on it and books bookshelves so that makes total sense for a philosophy group to be having coffee in that room 
It's just a natural, it's a natural part of the environment. It's totally comfortable. Anyway, so I got, I got the invite for coffee. I'd never been to the meetings before, uh, but I quite enjoyed it. I couldn't really contribute because I didn't know anything about philosophy at that point, and I still don't really, but, uh, but I make it up as I go along, and it sounds like I might know something sometimes. Uh, so from whatever the topic was for the first two hours, we went over the road, and then I started to get to actually get to know people a little bit started having one-to-one -one conversations rather than the group conversation and i find it much easier if i'm in if i'm in a conversation with one person on the edge of a group that makes much more sense to me than being in a group conversation but uh and so there's the one on the many link uh, the one on the many was the, the conversation we were having in the chat room before the show started so i thought i'd take that as a theme for at least some of the show. Uh, I found some some Pierre Grimes on exactly that subject, and uh, I've shared my screen and I've shared my sound, so in theory, I should be able to play some of that. It's a long video, so I don't know how much of it I'll be able to play in this show, but uh, let's take it back to, to the beginning and just let it play. It's an hour and 25 minutes, this video, so... If we do 45 minutes this week, or we do half an hour this week, it'll continue next week, because I don't want to just skip it. I want it to be a theme. I can make it a theme for three weeks in a row, and just do half an hour each week, possibly. Or maybe more, or maybe, maybe do 15 minutes this week, and then make it six weeks in a row. But we'll, we'll see anyway. I'll just let it play, and then I'll comment a little bit, and then maybe play a little bit more. So I need feedback from the chat room. All right, I'm getting feedback from the chat room that says that they can't hear the video, so I'm going to have to try that again or do something else. Uh, so what can we do? I'll just talk a little bit more, I suppose. Whoops. Uh, just drop some food on the floor. But it's, in a, it's in a plastic container, so no harm done. Okay, so let me just talk about my relationship with groups for a little while, because that seems to be... Uh, that's the theme from the chat room earlier on anyway. So back to this, this group that I go to on, used to go to, go to on Skype at the moment because of the current worldwide situation that I'm not talking about. Uh, I, I promise people another show that isn't political and doesn't have any virus in it. So, so I'm not going to mention any situation that's going on, but there is a situation going on. Uh, that, that means that we're meeting on Skype rather than in somebody's living room.
So the group, the group on Saturdays, the the Newcastle Philosophy Society group, uh, has a, a a few few members. The mem the people that I mentioned earlier on, uh, clinical psychologist called Joel, a guy called Roy, and there was a there was a woman called Janet there at the time, who meet on Sundays in this. This um, amorphous, not quite anything in particular, uh, discussions slash support slash um, having a go at people slash experimenting, pretty much anything you want it to be. If you can, if you've got the oomph and the and the intention for it to be that thing, it'll kind of morph into that thing, which is interesting when it's when it's eight up or nine people or ten people, all attempting to morph it into the thing that they want it to be it means that there's some clash of clash of personalities going on and there's some some undercurrents going on uh, the relationship between the group on sunday and the groups the new Metal philosophy society groups is antagonistic the philosophy people don't like sunday group at all at least they didn't when i was hanging out there uh, it had a reputation for being uh, aggressive and disruptive and, and not particularly pleasant which it is to be fair it is aggressive it is disruptive it isn't a particularly pleasant place to be but it is challenging it is for it is a group that forces you to deal with uh, failings in social situations of which I've got a lot because uh, I'm not very good with groups and never have been. So uh, one of the one of the underlying assumptions that nobody really spoke about, but which which was fairly obvious for the Sunday group was that and still is that you, when you turn up, you stay. Uh, the meetings last for three hours. Um, they were, as I say, they were in somebody's living room. They're now on Skype. It's slightly different on Skype, but when they were in Roy's living room or whoever's living room, the point, the idea of when you're there, you're there means that if somebody wants to confront you about something, if somebody's got an issue about your behavior or the way you're speaking or what you've said, and they want to deal with it in the room, which is kind of another assumption that... Uh, that is part of it, that you stay in the current moment and keep it, keep whatever things are going on as things related to people in the room. So in terms of projection, if you see, if you're talking about family issues from five years ago, in, the, in this group on Sunday, you would relate that to somebody in the room. So somebody in the room who reminds you of your parent whichever whatever it is or your brother or your sister or whatever it is so you you take the take the issue that you're dealing with from say five years ago for the sake of argument and bring it into the room and then it becomes something that's that's projected basically onto the person in the room and you get it out that way or it's it's transference Essentially, it's transference from the previous situation into the room, and then it's it's projected onto the person that you're talking to or about in the room, who represents your father figure or your mother figure or or your brother or your sister or one of your teachers or whatever it is. So it's a way it's a way of seeing projections and transference, and it's a way of pulling those I used to use it to to pull back my transference so that I owned it again and then I would go away and think about the situation and kind of release it and deal with it usually over a beer after the meeting either on my own or or in a smaller group And it's it it worked quite well for for a long time, and then there was there was some big issues came up for me in that group, big big issues. But my issue about 
about whether the world's trustworthy or not came up. Say, do I trust these people? Because when you when you're in that room on a Sunday, the world is that room on a Sunday, essentially. So it's like whatever you're seeing, whatever you're sensing, is something that you've you've had as as part of your filtering process in the world, but maybe you couldn't see it in the general world, but you can see it in somebody's living room on a Sunday afternoon. She can't run away from it. You can't leave. I mean, technically you can leave, but if you've agreed to be there, you've agreed to be there. So you have to deal with it as best you can up to the point where you can't deal with it. And it's, it's kind of run as, it's not a support group, but there is some, there are people who offer support. Uh, it's not, it's not a, a psychology group, but there are people who are experienced in psychology. It's not really a philosophy group, but everybody in there has some connection to philosophy of some sort or is interested in their own philosophy or other people's. So it means that it, it ver the, the issues that come up vary. The people vary quite a lot in various combinations. You'll get combinations that are more aggressive combinations that are more supportive so the, the the qualities in the group change and it's kind of it's got a an idea of heidegger behind it it's got being we were i was talking about being last week this group has got its own being it's got its own uh week to week personality or week to week um qualities so at some point it might be expressing uh, or some of uh, the majority of the people in that group might be expressing their own paranoia or their own lack of trust in other people in the group i was certainly one of those people for a good chunk of the five years that i've been going but if you talk about it you start to understand it a bit more and if you if you observe what what other people are doing or saying or how people are experiencing things you start to understand other people a little bit more so it's kind of got an encounter group feel to it as well this group it's uh, it's it sounds really really good when i'm describing it but it was very challenging when I, when you're in there very for me very challenging so I'm not going to pretend it was a pleasant experience at all, because a lot of it wasn't. Uh, but I did, I did make a commitment to be there. So uh, even though it's on Skype now, and we're doing things in a different way, and I'm only really dropping in at the moment because I don't, I don't really do three-hour Skype meetings. I don't like three-hour Skype meetings, but I can do an hour or an hour and a half sometimes. Uh, I might do more during the winter. Now that we've now that the weather's getting colder, I'll do a little bit more. Right, let's see if we can get this video thing working because I want to play. I do want to play a little bit of this. So share screen. Let's stop sharing and then start it up again. So share computer sound done. Share the chat room and then try again. So, if anybody's in the chat room that's listening, uh, if you can't hear the video, let me know. I'll let it run for about a minute, uh, but I, could, I appreciate some feedback if you can't hear it. Uh, if we talk about the one as a primary idea, then it's quite simple to reason and say, well, if one is your primary term, then why did the one become or cause a many? Or they fit together, one and many. So if you start out with the highest term being the one, 
then you have to account for multiplicity. You have to account for a process. You have to account for some way in which this can do that. You then must search for ideas to try to understand that. But when you have the idea of God, then to talk about a manyness, it doesn't follow that if there is a God, you necessarily have a problem of manyness, as you have with one and many. Indeed, with the problem of God and manyness, you need the idea of creation. When you have the idea of creation, then you have the idea of manyness, because creation is a multiplicity of forms. But there are many views of God that don't entail God being the one. The image of God as being a source of good gives us the problem of good and evil. You don't have the problem of good and evil as a primary set of ideas with the one and the many. You have the problem of good and bad. When you have the idea of good and evil, in any religion, then you're posing a counter force, a demonic force that's opposing the good. And therefore, you invariably have and must have a clash, a war, a conflict. But good and bad doesn't entail a clash. Now, nearly all religions say that God is one. But when they say that God is one, that's not the same thing as to say that God is the one. Because God is one doesn't preclude the fact that there can be other ideas of God as one or other things being ones. But when we say God is the one, then we mean that God is the one, and that precludes any other oneness. The one. Because as you move from a one and put in the word the, you move from a particular a one what. You move from an adjective, a one something, to a substantive, the one. That makes it a substantive. And it is the one, only one, the one. Now, in the kinds of reflection that we're going to engage in then, we want to know whether or not we can talk about why it is that the idea of the good is linked with the one. If you have an idea of the one, does it entail the good necessarily? How do we reason about this? Could it be that one of these, either one, is higher than the other? Well, let's assume that's the case and see what would follow. If, therefore, the ultimate term is the one, and the second term derived from it, the good, and then other terms following as a metaphysical creation, as it were, a process or unfolding, then we need to use just one idea. Whatever we want to be the highest term, we want it to be the most ideal term. That is to say, 
a term for which no other term can be chosen better than it. Therefore, the ideal term for the final, ultimate term must also not only be better, but the best. So then, if we put the one first and say necessarily it follows from this unfoldment, the good then follows it, so that this is the ultimate, and this is derived, then we can say, well, how can the ultimate term, the one, not be good? Not be good if it is the best. Because the best means the highest good. So that won't work. Well, let's turn it around and say, suppose we put the good and the one derived secondary. Well, if the good is the ultimate term and the next term derived from it is the one, then the good would not be one, but would be both, if it's not one, if it is not one, it would both be good and not good. And that's absurd for us because we want the highest term, the most ideal term, to be the best and the highest expression. Therefore, from this consideration, we're going to say that we can express the highest term as a hyphenated combination of these two terms. Now, in order to play with this, I think it's necessary to take a look at this idea of one, the one. First, we're going to take it in terms of anything we look at. When you look at anything, me, here I am, right? Certainly, I am one man. But with anything that you see, including this marker I have here, now most strictly, we want to reason as strictly as we can. We want to know whether what would describe most accurately your perception of this? Do you see the whole of it? Because when you see it, would you not agree there are parts of it that you don't see? Therefore, you don't see the whole of anything that's three-dimensional. Because there's always a part you don't see. So therefore, in perception, all you see is parts. Would you agree you don't see all of the parts in a unity? You assume all the parts are in a unity, and you hope seriously enough, that they will remain together. But you don't see that. You infer it. You make a judgment. You make a judgment that when I turn this around, its parts that were not visible to you now will become visible. So you infer a whole. When we call it one marker, we mean something curious because if there's a difference between a one and a unity and a parts and a whole, in what way can we say one sees a one? For from our reasoning, what you really see are parts. You infer it has a wholeness to it. You infer the parts coming together as a whole has a unity and that the unity implies, again, a one. Now, furthermore, would you not agree anything that we're talking about is subject to change? And if we wait long enough, whatever we're talking about will fall apart and become parts of something else. So therefore, it looks like we can say that everywhere we do this curious thing calling things one, it's not in the perceptual realm that we see the one. Now, somehow we grasp it as one. Look here. We grasp it 
has one. Would you not agree that all of the arts of camouflage is to take something and blur the boundaries in such a way that it seems to, to flow into the surrounding, merge with the surrounding. Therefore, you don't see it, you don't grasp it as one, even though it's visible, having all parts and a whole and a unity. So therefore, you need a boundary. You need a boundary. You need some kind of boundary. And you want to say something about the boundary, that it's not itself a part. It's not just a unity, but it has a continuation. Something happens to it with the unity. Now, maybe we can take this idea of one and apply it for a few moments to the idea of its symbolic representation. That's what we're going to do next. Look here. I have a name that I'm talking about. I'm talking about one. I have a symbol. Arabic. I could also use Roman and other ways of symbolizing one. Right. Now, let us now apply this idea for a moment to take another number, two. It has a symbol. And would you agree it has parts? and it has a unity. So the parts itself, each must be a one. Each must be a one. And they must come together, and then in that unity we call them two. Because would you agree if I put one over here and one over here, if I mean to consider that together, I have to in some way embrace them together to call it a two. So for each number, regardless of what number we're talking about, all it is are many ones. That's all there. The whole arithmetic is nothing other than many ones. Now, the many ones, wherever we stop counting, as it were, then we just have this, don't we? An unending number of ones. And if I say three, I mean this collection. If I mean four, I take that collection, and so on. So therefore, numbers are nothing other than a collection of ones brought together into a unity. But this isn't enough. There's an assumption we're making about representing this idea of one symbolically, and I'd like to take a minute out to propose something. And that will be this. To represent symbolically the number one is extremely difficult. And let me see if I can represent the difficulty. Suppose I put down this mark and say that's what I mean by one. Now, we're going to take this as its field. Isn't it not likely that to really ensure that I mean by one, that doesn't happen? Because now, or this doesn't happen. So therefore, would you agree, I mean by one, no. Gosh, this has to go on unendingly. But by the same logic, would you not agree? We wouldn't want someone to do this or this. And therefore, to represent this adequately, we need this again. Now, so that doesn't translate very well onto the radio, but it's a, it's a number one, point zero, 
and then an infinite number of zeros, and it, and before the one is another infinite number of zeros. That's what he's doing. He's drawing it on a blackboard, but uh, it doesn't translate to radio, so I thought I'd better let you know that. Here we go again. This is Pierre Grimes, and it's from the Post Nothingness channel. Uh, the video is called Appearance and Reality, the One Many Problem. I wonder whether that's enough, because actually someone might do this, might they not? And therefore, to represent the idea of one symbolically, to understand what we mean, would you not agree it entails that we have this? And by the same logic, and by the same logic, Now occur. So that was uh, one over one. And both of those ones with an infinite number of zeros. So 1.0 with an infinite number of zeros on the top. Infinite number of zeros before the one. Then underneath, you've got the same thing. So one over one with an infinite number of zeros before and 0 0.0 to infinity in in both places on the fraction. If I have this, what happens when I do this? All right, I think we've come to the end. Oh. The end of the way that this works on radio. Now that he's doing fractions, I think we need to stop. So that's not bad. We got a quarter of an hour out of him though. So Pierre Grimes is uh, is one of those people that used to hang out with with Alan Watts. And he's, uh, I think he's still alive. He's in his 90s. Uh, he's one of my favorite people on the planet. So I'm hoping he's still alive. And I'm, I'm really, really pleased that I found these videos. There's a lot of Pierre Grimes on YouTube, and I recommend all of them to everybody. It's a while since I did them, but uh, I do recommend all of them to everybody. Most of it's Plato. Or Greek philosophy in general. There's some, there's some Vedanta in there as well. Some Indian philosophy, some some non-duality. He, he relates the two things together. Those are basically the same. Uh, the logics, the logics the same, even though the language that they use to describe it's slightly different. So that's a way to link Greek, early Greek philosophy with with early Indian philosophy. Uh, there's there's a unity there. And uh, that makes it interesting for me because I'm always looking for things that are shared between religions and things that are shared between religion and philosophy, things that are shared between um, everything, really. I'm looking for the highest common factor. That's, that's part of what my journey's been, uh, rather than the lowest common denominator. But the lowest common denominator is also an interesting thing. Uh, I, pr I prefer to look for the highest common factor, but sometimes you need to look for the lowest common denominator. Uh, if we're doing mathematical terms. And uh, Plotinus is an interesting man. He's a man who developed all of this later on in the, the third century AD in Rome. Uh, but he, he came originally from Alexandria, I think, in Egypt and traveled around Persia for a while. And uh, settled, ended up settling in Rome. And uh, I'll I'll do a little bit of Plotinus at some point, but uh, for the moment, let's let's remove the one on the menu. Otherwise, I'll get distracted by it. I don't want to do that. So you're listening to Revolution Radio. My name's Dennis, and uh, you can find me online in a few different places. There's a the website for the radio show, which is freeassociationradioshow.com. Um, I've also got a, a project called imaginationcreatesreality.live, which I've been researching. Uh, at the moment, I'm researching neuro-linguistic programming and, and hypnosis for that. Uh, I've got my Reiki site, which is Reiki, Reiki Master Initiation dot com, 
and there's a, a mastermind group as well for, for sharing uh, potential cures for cancer. So that's called cancercuremastermindgroup.com. And in addition to all those places, uh, I'm Open Philosopher on Skype. So if you want to connect with me on Skype, send me a message. Tell me who you are and to run, reference this program, reference this show, and then I'll add you and we can have a conversation. And uh, at some point we might have a conversation on the radio show. But I'm not going to bring people on without actually speaking to them first. Uh, I'd quite like to make it interactive and make it more kind of user-friendly, but I'm still working out a way to do that. So I'm not... I'm not interested in pushing technology to the limit until I've got the hang of the technology I've got. <laughs> I can do phone-ins because I've, I've signed up for a Skype number, but I'm not going to do that yet. Definitely not doing that yet because I might, I might want to find a producer to do that for me as well. Uh, if, we, if we get to that point. So Revolution Radio is listener-supported. Uh, if you go to revolution.radio or freedomslips.com, uh, you'll find that there's a, a Patreon button there. At the top of the page, there's a chat room. Uh, at the moment, there's 31 people online. I'll do a shout out for the people in the chat room as well. Let's make this a little bit interactive. Where, where's my list? Visitor list. Here we go. So the people that are in the chat room currently, there's 31 people. So we've got Omega Logos, Eagle Flower. Mona Radler, Comet, Mer Bailey, Dry Fly Guy, OK, then uh, me, Pat Rabbit, Salmon and MG, Fact or Theory, Captain Fred, Boy Solomon, an old guy, I've uh, got Gino 2017. Uh, we've got Blasphemous Buddha, uh, Festus B, and everybody else has been there over the last kind of 24 hours or so. There's a few other people. Seri Sunflower, Stardust Man, Grog, The Jurist, uh, Jack Bop. That covers the last 24 hours anyway. So it tells you it's a busy place. There's plenty of interaction going on. Uh, it's a, quite a welcoming place. Nobody's going to jump down your throat. Uh, there's a lot of resources being shared, so I recommend people, if you can, go there and, and have a look. Just hang out there for a while. Get used to the community. Again, online chat is easier than chatting in somebody's living room on a Saturday, on a Sunday afternoon. Um, it can get challenging, though. Mostly it isn't. Mostly it's people sharing stuff, but it can get challenging sometimes, as life can get challenging sometimes. There's no, no way to run away from it. So if you run away the first time, you'll just you'll just have to sit and deal with it a second time. You might as well get used to the idea. But the the internet's full of projection and transference, so don't take it all seriously. It's not probably not all about you. It's probably just about the other person and their childhood and their relationships and their, their personal experiences being projected or transferred on you. That's mostly how the internet works. So if you take it personally, you're not going to get the hang of it, really. Now let's talk about shadow integration a little bit. We've got, still got five minutes or seven minutes before the, the music shows up. So shadow integration is a... As an idea that Carl Jung developed. And I, I tend to think about the whole world as, as a process of shadow integration. I know I said I wasn't going to get political, but certainly uh, the Trump presidency has been that. It's brought up a whole lot of things from the shadow uh, that people didn't want to think about or were trying to get away from it. You can't get away from it without accepting that it exists first. So uh, the, the way to deal with, with shadow issues, with, with anger and, and, and grief and guilt and all those sorts of things, 
if you're projecting them out, the way to to deal with them is to accept accept that it's your issue first of all, and then you can visualize it coming back, coming back into your body, and if it goes into a sh into your area by your shoulder or or by your heart or by your by your stomach, just notice where it goes in your body. And then if it's appropriate, you can you can work through it at a later date or the next day or over a beer on that evening. If you know where you're holding it in your body, and that's a bonus because you can you can visualize yourself taking it out and play with it and spin it and make it bigger or smaller or mess about with it a little bit, play with it, and then just throw it behind you and let it go. That's one way that I've been I've been playing with things this last week. Well that's that's one way to do shadow integration. Uh, there's other ways to do shadow integration. I used to do in this group a little bit of Reiki uh, before I went in. To, to bring up my my issues so that I could see them. So you, that's just setting an intention. Uh, so you can do it that way. Just set the intention that you want to see something that you're capable of dealing with, something that you're capable of accepting and integrating and letting go, whatever's appropriate. But you might want to let some of it go and integrate other bits. You might have a lesson there that you want to keep hold of and then just let go of the of the reaction part of that particular piece of energy. Because it's all it's all just a piece of energy ultimately. There's a there's a whole lot of anger floating around and you've got a piece of it. Or there's a whole lot of grief floating around and you've got a little piece of it. You've got a boundary around it and you're claiming it as your own. But actually it's just part of a bigger Kind of amorphous uh, cloud of grief or whatever it is so you can just you can do it by by just noticing where the boundary is find it in your body play with the size play with the shapes play with the color uh, you can spin, if, you, if it's spinning in one direction make it spin in the other direction what I do is I tend to make it wobble so I spin it in the other direction, then I wobble, then I let make it wobble so it goes, so the spin's 90 degrees, and then spins back to to where it, to the second place that it was. So from anti, if it started off anti-clockwise, then start spinning it clockwise, and then move it 90 degrees, so it's spinning clockwise but vertical rather than clockwise and horizontal. I'm hoping this makes sense to somebody. Uh, but I found that works quite well. Uh, it's been working for me the last week anyway while I've been playing with it. And I borrowed that from a, a guy who's a hypnotherapist that I found on YouTube. Uh, I'm just experimenting with it, but it seems to work. So I'm going to incorporate it into my, my own process and then into whatever process I do with other people at work or, or Reiki clients or whatever. Whoever shows up who needs it, essentially, because I've tested it on me, I know it's likely to work for other people who show up for, for me, if that makes sense. I see everybody as a kind of reflection or extension or uh, projection of me. So if somebody shows up, they're probably going to benefit from the stuff that works in my process. Uh, that's maybe a little bit narcissistic, but it's... It's one way of looking at the world if you're going through a, a healing process or shadowing integration, and it's a useful way of looking at the world. And it's just an idea. It's just an idea, really. So we've, we've kind of got to the place where I'm, I'm going to start to wrap up now. Uh, I'll just remind you uh, that my name is Dennis Barker. Uh, you can find all the content I'm doing on Revolution Radio on, on YouTube, but I post it at uh, 
free association radio show dot com and uh, the other, I've kind of spun off a couple of other websites so the cancer cure mastermind group dot com is a spin off imagination creates reality dot live is a spin off uh, the Reiki site Reiki master initiation dot com has been there for, for for ages so that one that one is is me from five years ago but everything else is kind of emerging from the radio show so I'm, I'm kind of getting the hang of just letting the feedback loop do its thing and the more people that can kind of get in and get interested and, and get get spinning if people want to spin then play with it play with the idea and if it works for you let me know if it doesn't let me know uh, but for most of the people who are listening, it's probably going to work on some level or another. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening. Um, so it's, it's Revolution Radio. We're coming up to the end of the show. Uh, if you want to make a contribution to the station, you can do that at revolutionradio.com. No, revolution.radio. Too many websites. That's, that's the problem. Uh, there's a Patreon button there, or you can make a one-off donation. Everybody's a volunteer here. There's some good shows. Um, there's some very good shows, in fact. Some of them go up and down a bit, but some of them are consistent. You'll find the ones you like. And when you find the ones you like, you're going to want to contribute in some way. So you're, gonna, you're probably going to want to make a donation or come to the chat room or get involved as a presenter or get involved in the roundtables. There'll be something that you want to do. If you, if you get hooked, you'll get hooked. That's kind of how it works. So that's it for me, more or less. Um, I'm going to just let this roll and wait for the music to come in. And I'll see you next week, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern U.S. time, 4 p.m. my time in the, in the U.K. Uh, I'm not sure what the time zones are going to be like in October. I don't know when the, the clock change happens in the States, but I'll work it out. And uh, I'll be here. I'll work out when I've got to be here, and I'll be here. And I, but I don't know what I'm going to be talking about. That that's just become an emergent property of the chat room this this afternoon. It might do that again next week, or I might bring something. There'll be a little bit more Pierre Grimes if I can find some more good stuff from him, which there's lots of good stuff from him. Uh, so I'll do a little bit more of that next week, uh, and some organic something from the chat room. But that's pretty much it for me. So I shall see you next week.